Good morning, everyone. Listen to me, all my people. Heaven is my throne, and all the earth is my footstool. I'm the head of all the nations. Don't you live in fear of anyone? Cause I still rule. Cause I'm the king of kings. But believe in me I'm ahead and you're the body Soon you be my bride For I will come and set you free Cause I'm the king of kings And I'm the lord of lords Every knee shall bow to me, every tongue will confess that I am Lord. All my enemies shall fall by the word from my mouth, that is my sword. All God's children sing for joy. God's children sing for joy. All God's children sing for joy. All God's children sing for joy. Cause I'm the King of Kings and I'm the Lord of Lords. I'm the King of Kings and I'm the Lord of Lords. Every knee shall bow to me, every tongue will confess that I am Lord. All my enemies shall fall by the word from my mouth, that is my sword. Sing for joy, our God's children. Sing for joy, our God's children. Sing for joy, cause I'm the King of Kings and I'm the Lord of Lords. Oh, I'm the King of Kings and I'm the Lord of Lords. Yeah, I'm the King of Kings and I'm the Lord. I'm the King of Kings, and I'm the Lord of Lords. Yeah. All right. Uh, good morning again. Could you turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter three, verse one? I'm going to hang this guitar up, put the mic on mute, and I'll be right back. All right, I'm back, Jack. <laughs> All right, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, if you could turn there if you haven't done so already. And uh, we're going to uh, start a new verse today in Ephesians chapter 3, verse uh, today, and, and we'll be looking at, begin to look at verse 5. We'll be two hours in this uh, verse, 
And again, we take multiple hours to do a, a verse. It's only because of the content. And uh, so, I, as I said in the past, you know, when we, we've done uh, big narratives like Genesis or Exodus, we've taken like sometimes chapters, several par paragraphs at a time. So it depends on the, on the, the literature I'm, we're studying. So in what's in it, the content. And so uh, we'll be looking at today the A part of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5, the first part of the verse, which teaches us that the mystery, the divine secret that Paul's been talking about in the previous verse, was never, and he did this in Ephesians 1, 9, he talked about it, uh, this mystery was never made known to previous generations. And the content of this mystery is found in verse 6. Basically, it's that, as we've been pointing out, that Gentile church age believers are co-heirs, co-members of the body of Christ, co-partakers of the messianic promise, with Jewish church age believers because of their faith in Jesus Christ, the justification, and their union identification with them through the baptism of the Spirit. It wasn't a mystery that Gentiles would get saved. Uh, it was what was, uh, was a mystery is that they would be on equal footing, having equal privilege and equal opportunity to execute the Father's plan for the church age, which is to grow to spiritual maturity and get rewards at the Bama seat. So, uh, in other words, Gentiles are not second class citizens. Now, we we take that for granted because for 2,000 years, the church has been primarily Gentile. Uh, the, in, every dis, in every generation of this dispensation, in every generation throughout history, in every dispensation, uh, that God has always set aside a, a remnant of believers in Israel. And today we call them Messianic Jews. So uh, we see that, uh, so for 2,000 years, we just, we have taken this, uh, us Gentiles have taken this for granted. Back in the first century, this was like astounding stuff. This was radical stuff. And uh, it was uh, shocking to the Jews, you know, the Jewish people, you know, like, look at Peter, you know, when he was told by God in a vision in Acts chapter 10, go into uh, to Cornelius, a, a, a Gentile Roman centurion, go into his, into his home, which the Jews didn't do. And they didn't eat with these people because of the dietary regulations. So Peter had to be told in a vision three times, it's okay to go in there. And he gave them the gospel and they received the baptism of the spirit like the Jewish believers in himself did on the day of Pentecost of June of 33 AD. Um, we'll, we'll, so we're going to uh, start off uh, Again, it's first to two hours in verse five today. We start off with, and then uh, we'll begin to look at verse six on Saturday. So, uh, without further ado, let's take a moment to sign the prayer. This is our custom. We take a moment to sign the prayer to examine ourselves to determine if we're in fellowship with God. Because any mental, verbal, or overt act of sin that we knowingly commit will cause us to lose fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But uh, when the church age believer confesses their sins, as directed by John in 1 John 1 9, confesses their sins to the Father, he, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In other words, he purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. We maintain that fellowship by obeying the Spirit who speaks to us through the scriptures which he's inspired. And that's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5 18 to be filled with the Spirit, and Colossians 3 16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. And if I, as the time to time I mention this, a lot of people take this for granted, this section, especially people who've been taught this stuff. Uh, remember, there are people who are taught this stuff that don't think they have to confess their sins anymore. Uh, I've been, I've been, I actually did a big uh, thing on that when I did First John out in Marion, Iowa, and wrote a lot of articles on them. And uh, because there are believers who are taught this stuff, they don't think they have to confess their sins because they read certain passages like Ephesians 1, 7, oh, I've been forgiven my sins, so why do I have to confess it? First of all, Jesus said to do that. Talking to his disciples at the disciples' prayer, not the Lord's prayer, it's the disciples' prayer because they're asking him how to pray. He, you know, he says, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. He's talking to believers there. So Jesus taught that. And, uh, and Paul, uh, the people, oh, Paul said, didn't teach it. Well, Paul said, uh, put off the old man, which would involve that. And of course, John was talking in the, specifically in the context of 1 John, a fellowship. And so, uh, uh, so you, the re, so in a, at the moment of your justification, when you first became a Christian, you got converted, all right? You'll experience those the forgiveness of sins throughout the rest of eternity. But in the meantime, because we have a sin nature, we live in the devil's world, and God is holy, okay, we have to confess those sins. I, I equate it to like uh, in the Wenstrom family. Uh, my mother and father, when I was growing up, uh, you know, I was a Wenstrom, and I'm always going to be a Wenstrom to the day I die. Yeah, they, they, they never disowned me when I disobeyed them. You know, when I, they told me to mow the lawn, paint the garage, or whatever they told me to do, vacuum the house. Um, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't be having fellowship with them. I, I would be not having supper, so I had to uh, come clean with them that I didn't do it, and then go out and do it, okay? And uh, so I would, could have fellowship, with, have dinner with them, you know? Otherwise, it was in my bedroom for the rest of the night. So that's why. So we have a, a distinction between our eternal relationship with God, which is not affected by us commit, committing sin, but our fellowship 
which is dynamic, not static like a eternal relationship. Uh, our, our fellowship can be disrupted. That's why John says what he says in 1 John 1, 9. And so by not confessing your sins, as a believer, you're going to be under discipline from God. And I mean, you're not, how can you, the word of God says, it's like the Holy Spirit's convicting these people to confess their sins. And so, uh, you know, um, I've, I've gone after guys uh, in the past and, uh, who were teaching this false doctrine and uh, two of which I knew. So I don't, I don't know if they're still doing that. I, I, I uh, but uh, it's, um, I'm sure two of those, I know two of them probably continue to do that. I didn't know those two, but uh Anyway, it's very sad state of affairs, and it's, it's all over the place now, so it's not something new. All right, without further ado, let's take that moment of silent prayer. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, another day to study your word. We thank you, Father, for the grace, the faith, the salvation you're working on behalf in eternity past, the person working the Son of the Cross, and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives from regeneration to resurrection. I pray, Father, that he would do a mighty work through both myself and those in the audience. I thank you for those who are in the audience, whether they're live or through the recordings at a later date. I thank you, Father, for technology and uh, people taking advantage of it and those who provide this technology with YouTube, with the streaming video service by them. Thank you for them. And I just pray it would function properly today and protect it from the enemy. I also pray today that you'd help me as the communicator to, uh, through the Spirit, to deliver, communicate this message with regards to Ephesians 3, 5, and that the mystery was never made known to previous generations, the mystery that us Gentiles have been uh, made co-heirs, co-members of the body of Christ, and co-partakers of the Messianic promise because of our faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, and uh, at justification and our union identification with him through the baptism of the Spirit. So we're co-heirs, co-members of the body of Christ, co-partakers co of the Messianic promise with Jewish church age believers. So we thank you for that grace, that unmerited blessing. And I so I pray today you'd help me to deliver the full counsel today with regards to this subject, with accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power. And I also pray for your people, help them to learn, understand what's being taught, to concentrate, to break down any barriers. Sin and Satan might put up the hint of that from happening. And I pray, Father, that they would receive their necessary spiritual nourishment. Your word teaches that man does not live in bread alone, but from every word that proceeds out of your mouth. And so I just pray, Father, that uh, if there are non-Christians that might be in the audience, thank you for them as well. Pray, Father, that they help at some point hear the gospel so that they can make a decision to either accept or reject your son, Jesus Christ, the Savior. And we know that you desire all people to be saved and come to an experiential knowledge of the truth. So with that, so with it, we pray for this, Father, this service. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, amen. All right, you should be at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to get there momentarily. I'll be reading from the Net Bible, and then my translation will be read the whole chapter in the Net Bible, and then we'll look at verses 1 through uh, 13 uh, and, uh, in my, uh, my translation, and then go back and start our study of Ephesians ch chapter 3, verse 5. And so uh, quickly, by way of review, for those who are new to the study popping in, there's always new people coming in through YouTube or the websites or the podcast. Uh, Ephesians was written by Paul in approximately between 60 and 62 AD during his first Roman imprisonment. While he was awaiting his appeal before Caesar, he had his own rented quarters and was able to receive people according to Acts 28. And also he was chained to a Roman soldier according to Romans 6. And uh, the recipients of this letter were not just the Ephesian Christian community, but the various, uh, the Gentiles, Gentile Christians throughout the various uh, Christ, uh, community cities and towns in the Roman province of Asia in the first century because this is a circular letter as we pointed out in detail and explained why. Uh, the purpose of this letter is to maintain unity uh, experientially between the Jewish wing of the church and the Gentile wing of the church and that would be to accomplish through the practice of the command to love one another. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was established this unity between the two wings of the church, the two races uh, at the moment of justification through the baptism of the spirit in a positional sense and also we have, we'll have this unity in a perfective sense when we're in a resurrection body, uh, which is, will take place at the rapture of the church, which is imminent. Uh, we see that uh, at this point in the letter, 
Uh, we've uh, talked about this mystery in verse 9 in relation to election predestination. Both Jewish and Gentile church age believers have been elected in eternity past uh, to the privilege of an eternal relationship and a fellowship with the, the triune God. And this was accomplished by means of predestinating them to adoption as sons. And then we see, uh, because of that, uh, Jewish and Gentile church age believers have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because of their faith in Christ, the justification and union and identification with him through the baptism of the Spirit. And this is developed further in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, where Paul says that both Jewish and Gentile believers are actually uh, now form the new humanity, which as we compared scripture with scripture means that uh, Jesus Christ, who is the head of the new humanity, the church, uh, is going to uh, dispossess Satan and the fallen angels at the second advent and restore mankind as the rightful rulers uh, over planet earth. Remember, Adam and Eve were designed to rule over the works of God's hands, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. But you read Hebrews 2, the writer there, which, who I believe is Paul, uh, was basically saying that uh, we don't see all things subjected to mankind, and that's because of the fall of Satan. Uh, fall, fall of uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, which at that point, Satan usurped the authority of Adam and Eve. We know that because he's the God of this world, Paul says. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the whole world is under his power coming to an end. And so, uh, Paul, remember Paul said to the Corinthians, don't you know you're going to judge angels, 1 Corinthians 6, 3? And so the reason why he says that is because the church at the second advent is going to just is do just that. And so Satan will be removed from the earth with his fellow evil spirits, and they'll be imprisoned for a thousand years till the end of the millennium. So that, that's so. Uh, that's what Paul's saying is very important, which leads us to chapter three, uh, where we have Paul starting off, uh, continues to develop in the autobiographical digression in the chapter, verses one through thirteen, where he discusses this mystery in greater detail, and uh, he again, as we said many times in the previous classes, and I mentioned to you a few moments ago, at the moment uh, the ch Jewish uh, Gentile church age believers are now co heirs co-members of the body of Christ, co-partakers of the Messianic promise with Jewish church age believers because of their union and identification with him through the baptism of the Spirit and at justification. So uh, we see that's the content of the mystery in this chapter and it develops further what we've been taught by Paul in the, in, in the prologue of the letter, in verses 3 through 14 of chapter 1 and in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. And uh, we see that uh, in verse 10, uh, Paul talks about this being the, through the church. This mystery would be made known uh, through uh, the multifaceted wisdom of God would be made known through the church, the members of the body of Christ, to the rules and authorities in the heavenly realms. That's Satan's kingdom, as we pointed out in chapter 1 in the first prayer. So we have chapter 3 begins as if Paul's going to start this second prayer. He's already had one in the first chapter, the, verses 15 to the end of that chapter. And now we see he's starting, it looks like he's appearing to start a, a prayer now, a communicated prayer he regularly offered up to the Father for the recipients of this letter. And yet he breaks it off. He doesn't resume the prayer and finish it until verses three, uh, verse 14 through the end of the chapter. In the meantime, but before he does that, uh, he uses what we call in Greek grammar a, uh, a first-class condition, which indicates the assumption of truth for the sake of argument. And the reason why the writer does this, Paul, is that he's trying to persuade the recipients of this letter, who are Gentile Christians, not to be upset by his adversities and the fact that he's uh, under house arrest in Rome when he was appealed before Caesar, and it was all unjustly that he was incarcerated. Because he was arrested, he was falsely accused by the Jews in Jerusalem of bringing a Gentile into the Jewish wing of the church. That was a false statement. And then we see that uh, under Gripper and uh, the... Uh, the, the Roman governors in Judea, uh, they held on to Paul and wouldn't release him, though they knew he was innocent and there was nothing worthy of uh, him facing the death penalty. And uh, so uh, we see that, uh, so Paul is using this first class condition in verse chapter 3, verses 2 through 13, in order to persuade the recipients of this letter not to get upset by his situation. And, he, and in the process of this first class condition, gives the explanation why they shouldn't be upset. Uh, so remember the first class condition has what we call an if clause, uh, that's called the premise or the protesis, and then the, the then clause is what we would call the apotesis or the inference from the premise. So in the premise, the protesis, the if clause, is found in verses two through uh, 12, and he talks about the stewardship of God's grace, which is basically a reference to his apostleship and his function as a pastor, a communicator of the gospel. 
And uh, so he talks about that, and then he develops that further. He talks about it first in verse 2, then he, then he goes on to explain it further in the process. And so when he gets to verse 13, then he, he finishes the first class condition saying, I don't be, therefore don't be discouraged or, by my adversities. This is for, not only for the benefit of myself, rewards of the Bama seat, and also uh, bringing glory to God because it would reveal to the church the uh, multifaceted wisdom of God and that God's going to use the church under the headship of his son, Jesus Christ, to dispossess Satan, the fallen angels at the second advent and imprison them for a thousand years. And then we see that uh, it's also going to receive, they're going to, it's result in them receiving glory and honor at the Bama seat for if they, if they appropriate by faith uh, what he's teaching them in this spirit-inspired letter that Paul wrote at back around 60, to between 60 and 62 AD from the city of Rome. So with that re uh, review out of the way, let's read chapter 3 and, and the NF Bible, and then we're going to go read it, verses 1 through 13 in my translation, and then start our work on verse 5 of chapter 3. So it says in Ephesians 3, 1, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, that by revelation, the divine secret was made known to me, as I wrote before briefly. When reading this, you'll be able to understand my insight into this secret of Christ. Now this secret was not disclosed to people and former generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Namely, that through the gospel, the Gentiles, our fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the exercise of his power. To me, less than least of all the saints, this grace was given to proclaim to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten everyone about God's secret plan, a secret that has been hidden for ages in God who has created all things. And the purpose of this enlightenment is that through the church, the multifaceted wisdom of God should now be disclosed to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, that's Satan's kingdom. This was according to the eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access to God because of Christ's faithfulness. That's the end of the protasis, the if clause. Now we have the inference or the apotasis from that premise or protasis. For this, in verse 13 we have it. Verse 13, for this reason I ask you not to lose heart because of what I'm suffering for you, which is for your glory. Why? Well, for this reason, it's basically what he just gave them. And also the, for this reason, we see in verse 1 is referring to the contents of verses 11 through 22 of chapter 2, which talks about Jew and Gentiles being the new humanity, the temple of God. And now he's, he, he breaks that prayer off and uh, dis, uh, uses the figure of Anna Caluthon. And then in verse 14, he resumes uh, the, uh, to communicate the prayer to them. So then he says in verse 14, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, I pray that according to the wealth of his glory that he may grant to you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner person, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, so that because you've been rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and thus to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now, to him who by the power that is working within us is able to go too far beyond all that we ask or think, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, let's read my translation of verses 1 through 13. For this reason, that for this reason again, is pointing back to chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, where Paul says, uh, the Gentiles who were once far away, not in a covenant relationship with God, had been brought near to the Jews who were near to God because they were in a covenant relationship with God through their faith in Jesus Christ, his, 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 his uh, suffering the wrath of God at the cross, has broke down the hostility between the two races, uh, be, which was established by the law and the, the dietary regulations of the law, which uh, prohibited really Jews and Gentiles from eating with each other. And also because the Jews misused the law and thought that God gave them the law because they were better than the Gentiles. That was not the reason. It was by grace that they got it. So he says, for this reason, because of the you, you know, by and under the authority of the one and only Christ, who was Jesus, for the benefit of each and every one of you as a corporate unit who are Gentiles, and you think he's going to pray now, but no, he's verse two. He's going to break that off for, with this autobiographical digression, which is in the form of a first-class conditional statement, 
which uh, goes all the way to verse 13, as we pointed out, and it, it, can, it, it basically it, uh, expresses the idea of, um, uh, indicates the assumption of truth for the sake of argument. It's a tool of persuasion, and he's trying to persuade them not to be upset by his imprisonment. So then he says in verse 2, starting the process, if, and let us assume it's true for the sake of argument, that each and every one of you, Gentile Christians, as a corporate unit, have surely heard about the stewardship, which is unique to the grace which originates from the one and only God, which was given to me for the benefit of all of you as a corporate unit without exception. It's a re responsive first class condition, meaning that recipients of this letter would agree with him, and that's why I have I inserted into the translation, my translation, in parenthesis, the phrase, of course, every one of you have in fact heard about it. Namely, here's verse three, he develops the stewardship of God's grace, what it means, namely that the mystery was made known for the benefit of myself as revelation, as I wrote beforehand in a concise manner, and he's referring to uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, and Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. Verse 4, concerning which mystery, and remember the, the Net Bible likes to use the phrase divine secret, which is an excellent translation. I probably should have used it myself. So concerning which that is, by each one of you making it your habit of having read publicly, all of, all of you will, for your own benefit, become able to comprehend my insight into this incomparable mystery, this divine secret which is the product of your union identification with Christ. This mystery was by no means made known to the members of the human race in previous generations, as it has now been revealed through the personal agency of his holy apostles, as well as prophets by means of the omnipotence of the Spirit, namely, that the Gentiles, our fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, fellow partakers, likewise fellow partakers of the promise, because of justification by faith, in and union identification with Christ Jesus by means of the proclamation of the gospel. I assume the position and responsibility of serving this gospel according to the gift originating from the one and only God's grace, which was given to me according to the activity produced by the exercise of his power. To me, the less than least of all the saints, this grace was given in order to proclaim for my benefit to the Gentiles the unfathomable wealth brought about by this justification by faith in and union and identification with Christ, specifically in order to cause everyone in the Christian community, both Jew and Gentile alike, to be enlightened as to what constitutes this unique dispensation, which is a mystery which has been hidden from previous ages because of God's will, who has caused each and every animate and inanimate object to be created. Consequently, the multifaceted wisdom produced by the manifestation of the will of God was made known to the sovereign rulers and governmental authorities in the heavenlies through the members of the church. This was in conformity with the eternal predetermined plan, predetermined plan which he the Father caused to be accomplished by means of our faith in and union and identification with the one and only Christ, who is Jesus, who is the one and only Lord, ruling over each and every one of us as a corporate unit. On the basis of our faith in and union and identification with him, each and every one of us are experiencing boldness, namely access with confidence to the presence of the Father by means of his faithfulness. Now we have the, uh, the apotheosis, the inference, the then clause, which uh, is going to uh, finish off the first class condition. Then he says in verse 13, Therefore, I myself urgently request at the present time that each one of you as Gentile church age believers as a corporate unit not be discouraged because of my adversities, his imp imp uh, unjust imprisonment, um, it's on behalf of all of you, without exception, he says, which are and uh, which adversities are uh, actually unique in character, making possible for each and every one of you to receive honor, and that's at the bema seat if they uh, uh, appropriate by faith and obedience to what he's saying in this spirit-inspired contents of this letter. So, as I said before, today well, we're going to look at the first first it will be in first of two hours in verse five. Today we'll, in the, we'll look at the A part, which teaches us that this mystery was never made known to previous generations. We're going to talk about what all that is about. But first, uh, how is this verse structured in the original text? Uh, well, Ephesians three five is composed of what we call a relative pronoun clause. We've seen those before, and following it is a comparative clause. So it begins with a relative pronoun clause. Uh, which is in the Greek text for those who are interested, ha heterais geneais uk egroriste ton anthropon. Uh, ton anthropon. Got to get the accent right there, right here. Okay. So this is translated by myself. This mystery was by means, by no means, made known to members of the human race in previous generations. The Net Bible, they translate it 
Now, this secret was not disclosed to people in former generations. And the comparative clause, which follows it, which the Net Bible translates with the, begins with, as, as telling us it's a comparison, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So that comparative clause, which follows that relative pronoun clause, in the Greek text is hos noon, apa kolupthe, tois hagios, apostolois, autu kai prophetes, prophetes, and punumati, which is translated by myself, as it has now been revealed through the personal agency of his holy apostles as well as prophets by means of the omnipotence of the Spirit. Now, the relative pronoun clause. Let's look at that today. And we'll, uh, the gender is neuter, both words, and the number is singular. Now, as we also noted in our study of this verse, verse 4, the word musterion, it means secret, mystery, divine secret, like the Net Bible says. And the reason why is because it pertains to a revelation that was not known to Old Testament prophets of Israel but has been given to the apostles and New Testament prophets by the Holy Spirit. Just think of that. You and I, the beneficiaries of something that the Old Testament saints, the great saints of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Daniel, and Jeremiah, and Moses, they didn't know this stuff. And no, in fact, you should think about this as a church-age believer, especially in America with the, all the plethora of beautiful English translations we have now. Uh, you have the complete canon of Scripture, the full counsel of God in writing, in your language, multiple languages. And, uh, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. You know, we got a, a pretty good here in this par part of the, 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 of the uh, church age. It's unbelievable. Uh, so here we are with revelation that's in writing for us. It's in our New Testament, which was not known to the Old Testament saints. And uh, that doesn't mean we're better than them. It just means God, it pleased God to do, do it as such. So as was the case, as we pointed out in our study of verses 3 and 4, as was the case in verse 3, uh, in uh, Ephesians 3, 4, the referent of this word uh, is uh, musterion, is the revelation that Gentile and Jewish church age believers are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body of Christ, and fellow partakers of the promise with Jewish church age believers, all because of their faith in Christ Jesus at justification and union identification with Him through the baptism of the Spirit. We noted in our study of verse 4 that Paul asserts in this verse that this mystery is produced by these Jewish and Gentile church age believers, faith in Jesus at justification and union identification with him. In other words, this mystery wouldn't be what it is if Gentile and Jewish church age believers were not united through faith in Jesus through the baptism of the Spirit at justification. So therefore, the referent of the relative pronoun host in verse 5 is this word mystery or divine secret mysterion which asserts, again, that Paul is, uh, which Paul asserts this mystery is produced by the church age believers union and identification with Christ. Now in our study, our exhaustive study of Ephesians chapter 3 verses 3 through 4, we noted that this ver these verses expand or explain in greater detail or provide more information about the Father's will for the church age believer in, in Ephesians 1 9. Namely, that it also involves Gentile and Jewish church age believers being fellow heirs, fellow members of the body of Christ, and fellow partakers of the messianic promise because, again, of their faith in Christ the justification and their union and identification with Him through the baptism of the Spirit as a result of their obedience to the gospel. So, therefore, in each instance, in each instance, the word is the same reference because the Father's will for the church age believer, which was not known to Old Testament prophets, is that Jewish and Gentile church age believers are fellow heirs fellow members of the body of Christ and fellow partakers of the Messianic promise because of their faith in Christ at justification and their union identification with Him. So, as we pointed out in previous classes, Ephesians chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 teaches that it was a mystery that the Gentiles through faith in Christ would become fellow heirs with these Jewish believers and fellow members of the body of Christ with them and fellow partakers of the Messianic, of the messianic promise uh, which is prom found in all four unconditional covenants to Israel. This mystery, as we pointed out, is not that the Gentiles would be saved because that was prophesied in the Old Testament, like in Isaiah 11, 10 and 60, verse 3. Rather, the mystery concerning the Gentiles is that they would again be on equal footing with Jewish believers. And this was never the case in previous dispensations. Now, the content of this mystery is threefold. The Gentile church age believers are fellow heirs with Jewish believers in the sense that they share in the spiritual riches God gave them because of His covenant with Abraham. Compare that with Galatians 3, 26 through 28. Gentile believers, the secondly, the second aspect of this mystery is that Gentile believers in Christ are fellow members of the body of Christ with Jewish believers. And there is one body, the body of Christ, Ephesians 4, 4, 
which has no racial distinctions, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and it has the Lord Jesus Christ as its head, Ephesians 5, 23, and each individual member of the body of Christ shares in the ministry. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 teaches that. And the third uh, uh, aspect of the, of the content of this ministry in Ephesians 3 uh, is that Gentile believers in Christ are fellow partakers of the four unconditional promises, four unconditional, unconditional covenants of promise to the nation of Israel. Now, the four un great unconditional covenants to Israel will be fulfilled. The one, we have the Abrahamic covenant, which deals with the race of Israel. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3, 13 and 6, 13, 16, and Genesis 22, 15 through 18, talk about it. And uh, we also see, secondly, we have the Palestinian or the land promise to Israel, which is first mentioned in Genesis 13, 15. We see it also develop further in Numbers 34, 1 through 12. Number three, there's the Davidic covenant, which the Davidic covenant deals with the aristocracy of Israel, the kingship. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 17 talks about that. You can compare that with, with Psalm 89. And lastly, we have the New Covenant, which deals with the future restoration of Israel during the millennial reign. And it's found in Ezekiel 36 and also the famous one, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. Now, this mystery about Jewish and Gentile church age believers is not only alluded to in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, as we pointed out, and in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 through 13, but it's also, as we pointed out, alluded to in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, because that ver those verses develop the idea of these Gentile Christians being elected by being predestinated in eternity past to adoption as sons of the Father, which we saw was taught in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. So there's a progression of thought going on in this letter with this regards to this mystery with, with relationship between the Gentile and Jewish church age believers. So as we saw in great detail, and if in our study of Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, this pericope teaches that Gentile church age believers are united with Jewish church age believers because of their faith in Christ, the justification, and their union identification with Him are accomplished through the baptism of Spirit at their justification. Thus, as we pointed out, the election and predestination of the church age believers to adoption as sons of the Father, as taught by Paul in the first chapter in, in verses 3 through 14, also involves. Jewish and Gentile church age believers being united together to form the new humanity who along with Jesus Christ will dispossess Satan and his fellow evil spirits as rules over this earth during Jesus Christ's millennial reign. Now look at Ephesians chapter 3 verse 5 in the Net Bible. It says, Now this secret was not disclosed to people in former generations. Now the word for generations in the Greek text is in the data feminine plural form. It's the word ganea which refers to generations of human beings extending from Adam up to the church age. In other words, the referent of this word, generations, is the dispensations prior to the church age. And this noun, Gene, is modified by the adjective heteros, uh, which is translated previously, and, be, and it refers to the dispensations that came before the church, the church age. And these dispensations which preceded the church age would include the dispensation of the Gentiles in Israel. But before we go any further with that, remember, when did the church start? Uh, there's some people that say the church was in the Old Testament. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. You're not reading your Bible. My Bible says in uh, Matthew 16, after Peter confessed Jesus being the Messiah, uh, he said, upon this rock, I, I will future to what that conversation was taking place. Future that conversation, I will build my church. So it's not in the Old Testament. So let's 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 stop with that. Okay, then we see it does begin uh, in uh, Acts chapter two. It's recorded on the on the day of Pentecost, in June of thirty three A.D. in fulfillment of Jesus' promise for the gift of the Spirit. Acts chapter one, he talked about this, giving them the Spirit, and then we see in John's Gospel seven, right, thirty seven through thirty nine, uh, he talks about the gift of the Spirit. And, and that's a result of the, the blessings flowing from the new covenant, which was based upon the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross. Remember the communion service, okay? Uh, this is the blood of the new covenant, this is the, the blood, blood of the new covenant in my blood, the covenant in my blood, new covenant in my blood, meaning the new covenant could, the blessings which contain the gift of the Spirit, forgiveness of sins, could, and all the other unconditional promises to Israel couldn't flow to the, Jew, uh, the Jewish people believers, Jewish church age believers, unless Jesus did what he did at the cross, okay? So, Gentile believers uh, believed on uh, Jesus, uh, who believed on Jesus, 
uh, starting off with Cornelius and his family in Acts, Gentiles received the baptism of the Spirit just like the Jewish believers, which astounded the Jewish believers like Peter. And so, the, so something new had happened. This is what we call dispensations. A new, a, a new thing has come into the picture, and this is why we believe that God is looked as as history is is could be uh, mapped out in dispensations. And there's different uh, the, some different how many there are. It doesn't really matter, but there is distinctions between periods of history. There's a distinction between the, the period we're living in now, which ends with the rapture of the church, which is imminent. Uh, in the first advent of Christ in the, in the during the Old Testament Israel and prior to that, so thing, things have changed. Okay, God, we get pro, revelation is progressive, and so we see that this word generations is referring to the generations of human beings who, who lived in, in the history extending from the creation of Adam up to the Church Age. In other words, the word generations is referring to the dispensations prior to the Church Age. So the word genea is modified, as I said before, by the adjective heteros, which is translated previously, which refers to the dispensations that came before the church age. And so, uh, just, you know, just a quick little thing about dispensations. A lot of people don't, one of these, I, I can't believe I've never done a series on dispensationalism. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, but anyways, you know, let's, I'll just give you a little brief. If you really want to read a good book on dispensationalism, you got to get Ryrie's book, you know, Dispensational dispensations today dispensationalism today and there are other good books and uh, but you know dispensations you know if you look at it, we you know uh, get a, uh, a, a definition for de uh, dispensation i want to get uh, this is this i'm looking at right now <laughs> i'm looking at my uh, article on dispensationalism but i want to get a, a um, little brief uh, thing i just uh, what do you call it, definition and a little understanding of it because some people don't really understand what it means. Dispensationalism recognizes distinction, this is from my article on dispensations, uh, dispensationalism recognizes distinctions in God's program in history. Uh, the dispensationalist follows the principle of interpreting the Bible literally and does not allegorize away the Bible and thus he is consistent in his interpretation. And let me explain what I mean by that. Um, like people who are covenant theologians, okay, my brothers and sisters in Christ, they're covenant theologians, um, and I myself and a lot of others that were dispensationalists, we, you know, when we comes to the, the promises of Israel, we believe in a literal grammatical interpretation of Scripture, and they do too, but when it comes to many times with the Old Testament prophecies, and pro they they fas they forsake that, and uh, and and so therefore we don't believe that's right. Uh, for instance, the, you know, like a lot of people think that the church has replaced Israel. That is not the case. Uh, there is, as I pointed in the past, um, even dispensationalists, some dispensationalists uh, don't get this, but they should. There is a um, discontinuity between Israel, and I say Israel, born again Israel, and the church, and there is continuity. First of all, the discontinuity. Uh, Israel born again Israel, remnant, the, the, uh, the remnant of Israel that's believers, regenerate. There's only one race, whereas the church is composed of two races. So there is the discontinuity. The continuity is, is that, remember Jesus, we read Paul, we studied Paul in Ephesians 2, he says that the teaching of the apostles is the foundation of the church. But then you read, and it was in Matthew, it was in Matthew 12, Jesus says to the 12 apostles, who are members of the church, and the, their teaching is the foundation of the church, that they would rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. So what we see is the remnant of Israel is uh, in the church. In fact, the Gentiles, believers, as we saw in Revel, uh, Math, uh, Romans chapter 11, and Paul talks about this in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, Gentiles have been united with the Jewish believers. We're the wild olive branch, Paul talks about, the Gentiles are. And the olive tree is regenerate Israel. The branches that have fallen, have been off, taken off, are unregenerate Jews. The branches on the tree are regenerate Jews. And we as Gentiles, born again Gentiles, were engrafted in contrary to nature. They didn't do this in the natural realm. To show you, he, the reason why Paul used that kind of language is because he's trying to show you the supernatural nature of what happened and how astounding it is that us Gentiles got in, united with Jewish believers and we're on equal footing with them, which has never happened in history. So, dispensationalism 
we again recognize their distinctions in God's program. And we don't believe, friends, we don't, be, we, uh, we don't believe that the church has replaced Israel. Uh, that's called supersessionism or replacement theology. That's wrong. That's false. And the reason why that is, because God promised that the Israel would always be a nation. And he also said that, you know, the four unconditional covenants to Israel, all right, that means that the unfaithfulness of the Jews is not going to keep that from being fulfilled, that, those covenants, those covenantal promises. Unconditional covenant promises means it guarantees the future of the nation of Israel. So that's very important. So a lot of times my, my brothers and sisters in Christ are covenant theologians or involved in replacement theology. They, they don't get that. So... Um, Furthermore, when we talk about, I just want to get a definition here. I'm looking for my definition on this, uh, this particular word for dispensationalism. Uh, let, me, uh, let me get this here. Hold on one sec. I want to get a great, he, Ryrie is uh, excellent, but let me see, uh, see if I can get it over here. Okay, there we go. I knew it was in there. Ryrie says the following, and this is from his Dispensationalism Today, page 29. He says, a dispensation is a distinguishable economy in the outworking of God's purposes. Uh, the dispensations are economies, he says, instituted and brought to their purposeful conclusion by God. So to summarize it, dispensationalism views the world as a household run by God. Two, in this household world, slash world, God is dispensing or administering its affairs according to his own will and in various stages of revelation in the process of time. Progressive, re revelation is progressive. Verse three, uh, the, the three, third aspect to summarize dispensations is that these various stages mark off the distinguishably different economies and the outworking of God's total purpose and these economies are dispensations. So uh, we see that, uh, that uh, the, the, uh, this, uh, this particular pr uh, principle of dispensationalism is very, very important. So when we talk about dispensations, there's different classifications of dispensations. Um, and mine are uh, like uh, um, I, great dispensationalists like um, was it Wolver, you know Schaefer, you know guys like that, Schofield, um, you know McLean, Alvin McLean, uh, there were a whole bunch of them, and uh, you know Dr. Arnold Freudenbaum, he's a dispensationalist. Um, you know Dallas was known for the dispensationalism, Dallas Theological Seminary, and uh, so. You know, there are different classifications. The number, the way you classify them is really, it, it, you know, everybody's got the way they, diff, there's different ways of classifying them. And, and there's so many different ones, different views about it. But at the end of the day, we all kind of agree, yeah, there's uh, different, there's different dispensations and, but guys, we all differ on what, how we're going to classify them. So this is my shot at doing it. And I got, one of these days I got to, I got to, I have to update that article on dispensations because uh, I got a lot to add to it. But anyways, so the dispensations, let's get back to my notes here. These dispensations which preceded the church age, which Paul's talking about in previous generations, talking about previous generations, dispensations prior to the church age, these would include the dispensation of the Gentiles, I call it, and Israel. The dispensation of the Gentiles, from, from my definition of the cl or classification of the dispensations of history, the dispensation of the Gentiles begins with the Edenic period which can be divided into four periods. Uh, the, number one, Edenic, that means Adam to the fall. And number two, the antediluvian period, that's the fall of Adam to the flood. The post-diluvian period, Noah leaving ar the ark to, call, to the call of Abraham. And number four, the patriarchal period, which is the call of Abraham to, to the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. Now, the dispensation of Israel is broken in, out into six periods. Uh, for those of you who have my notes, uh, the last three of these periods I, I were not were omitted by accident. I, I, when I, I must when I, when I copied and pasted it from my dispensational article onto my Ephesians three five article, I, I didn't get it in there. So I'll, I'll I'll make sure it gets up there, and I've already done it. So when it gets posted on the website, these in PDF format Ephesians three five, it'll have it in the, these three uh, periods. That is one. We have the theocratic kingdom. I call it. That's uh, Exodus to Samuel. And, and then we have the United Kingdom, which is from Saul to Rehoboam. And then we have the, the Northern Kingdom. This is uh, because of the, the uh, Civil War. Northern Kingdom will be Jeroboam to Hosea. The Southern Kingdom is Rehoboam to Zedekiah. And the fifth period is the Babylonian captivity, and then which went from 586 to 536 B.C. And then lastly, 
we have the restoration of Israel as a nation, and that would be Judah. And that was in uh, B.C. 536 to B.C. 4, this period. Now, lastly, the last dispensation before the church age is, and a lot of guys don't classify it as a dispensation, but I do. Uh, the last dispensation before the church is the dispensation of the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ, or in other words, his first advent, advent which began with the, his birth and culminated in his death, resurrection, ascension, and session to the right hand of the Father. Now, there's overlap, though, because he was during the period of the law. He had to fulfill the law perfectly, okay, so that we could be reconciled as sinners to a holy God. So there's overlap, but it is different. The, when G, the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ's first advent was definitely different. God was dealing with the world differently than any, than any other period. I mean, his son, I mean, that's a dis, just him being on the earth is, is distinctive from any other period in history, right? So I, I recognize that distinction. And I also recognize that there's overlap because he, he was living as a Jew during the period of the law, okay? Now, with that out of the way, but these previous dispensations or generations that Paul talks about in Ephesians 3, 5, let's keep going because he says, if you look at Ephesians 3, 5, he says, now this secret, I'm reading from the Net Bible again, this secret was not disclosed to people in former generations. And so, let me give you my translation of uh, the ESV. Uh, they have that verse translated and that relative pronoun clause as, which was not made known to the sons of men. Notice how they change, in other generations. Notice the phrase, the sons of the men, and the Net Bible uses the word people. And in fact, they have a note where you say it's literally, this expression means sons of men. It's a Semitic idiom, they say, referring to human beings. And so thus, therefore they say people, which is a good translation. So they explain their translation, which I like to do myself. So, as was the case in Ephesians 2.2, the word sons, we us, we us, here in Ephesians 3, 5, does not mean the sons, but rather the offspring. In this context, pertains to the offspring of human beings without reference to their gender, okay? Which is, the Net Bible brings out with the phrase, the, the expression, the translation, people. So here, it refers to the offspring of the human race, or people who lived during the dispensations prior to the advent of the church age. And the word for men there, anthropos, it's used in a generic sense for the human race, and it functions here as a genitive of apposition, or as some call it, an epexegetical genitive, which means that it's identifying what race these offspring belong to, namely, the human race as distinguished from the angelic race. Now, therefore, this expression in the Greek text of Ephesians 3, 5, weoi ton anthropon, literally means the sons of men or human beings. And it's, again, like the Net Bible says, it's a Semitic idiom designating members of the human race. Now, as we come near the end of our lesson here, the reader, you and I, must understand when we look at this passage in Ephesians 3, 5, that this expression does not refer to unregenerate humanity, but rather regenerate humanity. Don't miss this, what I'm saying here. It says, uh, in verse 5, now this secret was not disclosed to people in former generations, okay? They can't be unbelievers, okay? They have to be believers. So, we must understand when we look at this expression, it does not refer to unregenerate humanity, but rather regenerate, born-again humanity. Why? Because this mystery doctrine that Paul's talking about in context can only be understood by those who have received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Because the Spirit inspired this revelation and gives illumination with regards to its application and significance. You can compare that with 1 Corinthians 2, that big passage, and Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, which we studied a few months ago. So therefore, in, the, in context, people, the reference of this expression, two people, or the, the, uh, the sons of men, as the ESV has it, uh, or as I translate it, and what do, how do I translate it? I translate it magnificently, you know. This mystery was, made, was, by no means, by, was by no means made known to members of the human race in previous generations. So I, like the, I have two uh, members of the human race. So the reference, of that expression is church age believers who have received the indwelling of the Spirit when they were declared justified through faith in Christ and were consequently placed in union with Christ, identified with Him in His crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, session at the right hand of the Father through the baptism of the Spirit. So, the word for uh, made known, gnorizo, and here it pertains to causing information to become known to others and it is emphatically negated by the emphatic negative adverb, which is expresses an absolute direct full negation, and the passive voice of this verb indicates that this mystery 
doctrine never received the action of being made known to members of the human race who lived in the dispensations prior to the church through the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit as it has now been made known during the church age. So uh, we see here that, uh, that uh, we talked about with this former generations about this secret, this mystery again. It's, the, it's that Jewish uh, Gentile church age believers are uh, co-ears, co-members of the body of Christ, co-partakers of the messianic promise uh, because of their faith in Christ. With Jewish, Jewish church age believers they are. And this is because of their faith in Christ, the justification, and their union identification with him through the baptism of the Spirit. So that baptism of the Spirit united them with Jewish church age believers, not to mention, of course, the head, Jesus Christ. That's the content of the message. That, Paul said, is not, was not, never known to the people in the Old Testament. And the people, the only people who could understand it would be, they didn't know, understand this. They, didn't, they, they never understand it. They didn't get to hear it. Forget about understand. That's they never understood, or they never listen. And they never was able, able to uh, hear it because it was not made known to them until the church age began. So we're a privileged group of people. We got a, a revelation that Old Testament saints never got, and not because we earn and deserve it, but because of God's grace. All right. Well, we've run out of time. We'll pick this up uh, on uh, Thursday at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. Lord willing. Thank you for joining us. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this lesson be a blessing to your people, bringing glory to you and your son, Jesus Christ.